uh, College in Japan, Satoru uh, Aonuma, uh, is going to speak on a mere rhetoric that matters, revisiting the rhetoric of inquiry and the science. Oh, I guess this is an ideograph here. Middle dot uh, debate in middle dot technology debate in Japan. Thank you, Ron. Oh, uh, let me. My paper is about uh, rhetoric of science. Oh, my paper is about rhetoric of science in Japanese written discourse. And uh, oh, before starting my paper, thank you for all coming. And I really appreciate your presence. And also, I'd like to thank our lovely interpreters translating this uh, awkward, you know, English language paper, but, you know, we, I analyze Japanese discourse and how they can translate that in beautiful language of Arabic, you know. Here you go. Uh, let's show. Uh, I'm a Mac user, so I don't know how to deal with this window thing. But, OK, here we go. Thanks. Uh, in August 2010, the Science Council of Japan, the Japanese equivalent of the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, issued an interesting statement. The statement strongly recommended that the word kagaku gyujutsu, or science technology, the term that put together two Japanese words, science and gizutsu in tandem, should be replaced with kagaku middle dot gizutsu, the one that combines yet separates these two words, science and technology, by inserting middle dot in between those two words. In the public discourses concerning the country's science and technology policy, let me give you this text. This is the Verratian text of the uh, uh, recommendation. You see middle dot between awkward letters, right? And this is what they suggested. For the Council of, Science Council of Japan who drafted this recommendation, the need for the, this lexical change is compelling. If we are to achieve the sustainable development of science and technology, including basic research that encourages more innovation, as well as to check and correct the unwanted outcome-oriented biases in the nation's science technology policy and administration. On these accounts, the Science Council specifically suggested that this lexical change be reflected in the possible revision of the country's science and technology basic law and other relevant legal and legislative statutes. Here's the uh, Japanese or English translation. Upper uh, first, uh, I just put the kagaku gizutsu, which is basically science technology. There is no d middle dot between those science and technology. But they wanted to replace that particular term with the second one, kagaku dot gizutsu, which is science middle dot technology. Now, from the rhetorical and rather innocent bystander's point of view, I found this apparently marginal lexical change proposed by the science scientific community in Japan very interesting. As Sieninger points out, a middle dot between words has significant or signifying functions. In the West, for example, it was used to indicate the presence of space between words, for example, in classical Latin language. In case of the Japanese language, a space between words is extremely uncommon, if not grammatical. Just as in many other East Asian languages, Japanese instead use the middle dot to indicate the presence of a semantic space. In addition, in a way similar to the letter E or A in Derrida's De France in French language, a middle dot is not pronounced in modern Japanese. Orally, there's no difference between science technology and science middle dot technology. In written Japanese, however, that middle dot becomes significant and meaningful in the discourse as it marks the presence of a space between words. In other words, the middle dot inserted between science and technology denotes that there is a semantic gap or dissociation between those two, namely the absence 
of necessary and essential relationship between science and technology. Now, when I heard about this for the first time, I felt very amused and pleased. Now, Japanese techno scientists finally came to term with their own rhetoric. Having observed the respectable members of the Japanese scientific community engage in the issue of discourse and language use, I had a feeling similar to the one Michael McGee and John Lyne once wrote regarding the relationship between science and rhetorical art. At the 1984 University of Iowa Humani Humanities Symposium on the Rhetoric of Human Sciences, McGee and Lyne kidded those who convened there, including big-name philosophers of science like Thomas Kuhn, Richard Doherty, and Stephen Turming. What are nice folks like you doing in a place like this? I further took it that this development may well be an occasion for rhetoricians to celebrate the rhetorical turn in human sciences, the academic community at large now acknowledge that the way scholars argue may in part determine what will be counted as an increment of the knowledge they are supposed to produce and preserve. Yet, the uh, celebratory and uh, feeling of joy on my part uh, dissipated, or rather waned, as I discovered that this rhetorical turn is not without criticism. As it is reported in the National Daily, bad folks took issue with this lexical change. Here we find the oldest and most typical denigration of rhetorical art. That is, in the eyes of many of these critics, this middle dot insertion between science and technology is a rhetoric without substance. For them, this very change is nothing but the matter of language and discourse that incurs no change in substance of scientific research or the formation of the nation's science and technology policy. Now, of course, as rhetoricians or students' rhetoric, we have learned how to deal with this sort of criticism. At the same time, however, I do think the criticism should merit our serious attention. In this brilliant study, of social etymology in Japan, a scholar named Hirano suggested that science technology, the term without middle dot, was first invented and began being used in the early 1940s by science and technocrats to indicate that science and technology are indispensable and that their collaboration or collusion is indispensable for the wealth of the nation, that is the great Japanese empire. Namely, I realize that any attempts to rhetorically dissociate science and technology is extremely difficult, if not impossible, because their relations expressed in this very rhetorical idiom are always already grounded in the nation's historical materiality. Now, along this line, I also cannot but think about this issue of the middle dot insertion between science and technology against the backdrop of our peculiar political material condition and rhetorical situation of the day. That is the post-311 Japan, where the nuclear accident at Fukushima Daiichi still constitutes our biggest science and technology concern. In fact, nuclear power has been a prime example of science technology that draws the attention of rhetoricians and rhetorical sensitive scholars. Shapiro, for example, writes, Attitudes toward nuclear energy are, to a significant extent, a function of the discursive frame that competes successfully for public attention. The selling of nuclear energy has been affected primarily through the use of the venerable strategic code. Magee and Line also mentioned nuclear power as an example of a more common and pressing problems in the practices of techno-scientific rhetoric in the United States. Now, Speaking specifically of Japan, science technology is what the Japanese could identify with because doing so would help them to recover their national pride, which is lost or which was lost in World War II. Many still conceive that science technology is what has made Japan number one in the world. Not anymore. We know that. Regarding nuclear power in particular, nuclear power in Japan is presented as a significant national dream for the post-World War II generation Japanese. This dream of technology has become part of the nationalistic discourse of science technology in Japan, playing a powerful role to promote the peaceful use of nuclear power. 
as well as to shape a post-war political rhetorical climate where science, technology-driven economic growth becomes paramount important national imperative. Further, the Japanese nuclear power is part of the governmental industrial complex, which many of, uh, of us alternatively call nuclear power village. Just as in any Japanese village, the like-minded nuclear industry officials, bureaucrats, politicians, and scientists have prospered by rewarding one another with construction projects, political, financial, and regulatory support. The few openly critical or skeptical of nuclear power safety become village outcasts, losing out pr on promotion and backing. Now, in this context, I would like to go back and shed a more critical light on the reasons the Science Council of Japan offered in support of the new term, science middle dot technology. The reasons are, one, further encouragement of basic research, and second, the need to check and correct the unwanted outcome-oriented bias in the country's science and technology policy. Now, regarding the issue of basic research, perhaps we could call for the relative independence and freedom of science from its application and outcome. As Polanyi states, throughout modern history, science has made an immense impression on the general public, and this was strong ever, if not the strongest, in the earlier century of modern science, when the practical value of science had been little thought of. Now, given the unique political economic development in modern Japan and historically grounded rhetorical association between science and technology, of which nuclear power is a typical example, however, inserting a middle lot alone does not seem to help elevating the status of basic research, which has no tangible outcome or evident applied values. Now, as for the second reason, the problems of outcome-oriented biases, again, merely inserting a middle dot between science and technology seems unable to penetrate the hegemony of the governmental industrial complex deeply entrenched in the nation's science and technology policy. To give a more politically enabling substance to this lexical change, there is a compelling need to create the counter-public sphere of democratic governance, a space where citizens can participate more critically in public deliberation over the nation's science and technology policy. Namely, we need a space marked by a middle dot, not only in writing, but also in the political material world. Now, absent such a space, science middle dot technology will most likely remain marginal and inconsequential despite its good intention and powerful political rhetorical potentials. Now, my rhetorical exploration into this uh, rhetoric of science middle of technology leads to the rather pessimistic outcome or ending. There are good reasons that this lexical change is resisted. Most likely, that change alone would do little to help us penetrate the dominance of science technology in, mo in modern Japan. Yet, I do think that, as a student of communication and rhetoric, I should no longer be a third-person bystander regarding this issue. It is important to note that Science Council of Japan plays an umbrella-like role for various scholarly associations and societies in Japan. Now, Communication Association of Japan, the country's premier scholarly organization for communication scholars, of which I am a member, it's one of the uh, Science Council's member organizations. However, curiously enough, when the Science Council was drafting this statement in which they recommended the use of middle dot insertion, to the best of my knowledge, no communication and rhetorical scholars were consulted. In other words, just at the middle dot inserted between science and technology, rhetorical and communication scholars are neither voiced nor heard in the uh, Science Council's statement of recommendation. In fact, despite its function as the umbrella organization for disciplines and fields that encompass natural sciences, social sciences, and the humanities, the governing body of the Science, science Council has been primarily dominated by hard scientists. Yet, as the member of one organization that comprises the Science Council, I am indeed part of it and feel responsible for what it does. On this account, it is 
Important to note that in the very same statement that recommended the middle dot insertion, the Science Council also urged the deletion of a part of the nation's science and technology basic law, especially Article 1, that excludes the humanities from the nation's science technology. In the spirit of the rhetoric of inquiry in 1984 Iowa Humanities Symposium, rhetorical scholars should stay careful so that our expertise is not to be once again patronized to serve the interests of others in and outside academia. As scholars, however, we are men and women of letters after all, at least in one way or another. Following Derrida, that is exactly why I wanted to speak, therefore, of a letter and of a middle dot, which is not voiced or heard at this occasion. Thank you. Outstanding. All right, do we have some questions over here? Uh, thank you. Um, so I was interested, on uh, page three of your paper, you discuss referring to the works of Kuhn to argue that science is just another rhetorical community. Right. Um, I guess, so first, which works are you referring to? Like the standard structure of scientific revolutions? I think so. So I guess uh, my question then is, I guess it sort of diverges from my understanding of uh, Kuhnian paradigm. So could you, I guess, elaborate on how you would use that work to justify science as a rhetorical community? Probably. Uh, the better work may be Tillman, not really Kuhn. Uh, Tillman talks about uh, evolution of uh, concepts or conceptual evolution within science. And uh, Pelman, uh, Tillman emphasizes the importance of you know, communication within a uh, scientific community, and that kind of communication does make some, uh, ch some change in, uh, you know, scientific community. So probably, you know, Kuhn talks about a uh, paradigm change as a revolution, which has little to do with the communication, probably. But along the same line, uh, I guess uh, I should have mentioned that to, 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 to tell me more. All right, thank so. you. Thanks. Any other questions? Uh, thank you, Satoru. Um, I'm curious on a couple of levels. Uh, one is whether the insertion of the middle dot between science and technology is a unique occurrence in Japan, or are there other instances where a middle dot has been inserted between uh, a couple concepts? I guess I'll, I'll start with that and see where we go. Right. Uh, I don't know much about uh, uh, the controversy caused by uh, insertion of middle dot in other contexts or other countries, other languages, but it's being used uh, primarily to indicate the space. That's for sure, right? Uh, in, in other instances in Japanese. Oh, okay. Uh, well, not really. Not really. Uh, the middle dot insertion does not usually uh, raise eyebrows of many. You know, it's just a just grammatical thing and just, uh, you know, just uh, formalities and stuff like that. And actually, it is the kind of formalities, but in this particular case, inserting uh, uh, middle of between science and technology is problematic because there, there, there are many people who wanted to talk about science technology as one concept, and separating those two is problematic for, to, for many people. So yes. it's, a, it's a dissociative kind of argumentative right. strategy. Right. Uh, uh, but it's unique. That's really where I'm going with the question, uh, that it's unique within Japanese language and culture that other linked That's right. terms have not been dissociated. Right, right. For example, uh, in Japanese language, we don't use a word space. Uh, when you take a look at, for example, oh, you have a, a copy of uh, a part of the uh, recommendation uh, as part of the uh, paper attachment, you can just see that uh, there's no space be between words in Japanese language. There's little space, uh, punctuations and stuff, but other than that, uh, uh, you have like, you know, there's no word space, right? You see that? Right. But, but putting a space between words means something. And uh, putting a middle dot between words does mean something as well. Yeah. So. I was just wondering if it were a normal kind of uh, activity. Okay, but, uh, right. thank you. Any other questions? 
Well, I have one small question. I'll use the language of rhetoric. And, and you know, you have the ostensible arguments as to why they made the change. But I'm kind of curious as to what was the exigence behind the SCJ making or inserting that middle dot? I mean, right. what were some of the rhetorical and political implications that, uh, or that, or that factored into that particular decision? Right. Maybe uh, I haven't... Uh, uh, I, I try to find that reason behind this, but you know, I couldn't find any you know tangible evidence for this. But uh, my speculation is, uh, at this point in time, uh, hard scientists have been self-reflexive about what they have been doing. Mm -hmm. So uh, by nineteen, no, uh, 29, 20, 2009 and 20, uh, two thousand and ten, they started talking about this and made this recommendation. Uh, for some reason, uh, just being self-reflexive about what they're doing, you know, uh, impacts of science into societies and stuff like that, probably, you know, global warming and all these things, and probably these may be the reason. And after, right after that, you know, Fukushima accident happened, mm -hmm. so it's kind of ironic that, uh, you know, a science council recommendation kind of predicted, you know, what, uh, you know, science technology would lead us to. It's kind of disaster at a... Uh, but uh, that's a good question. Probably I need to uh, dig into more. Well, because one, uh, one of the, the reasons I had asked that question is I wonder if it was an, an ethos question to some degree, because I was thinking of it comparing it to maybe the United States situations that somehow, you know, you want to connect the, the or disconnect the purity of science potentially. Right. So when scientists then speak to the public, they could do with a right. great deal of ethos as opposed to the technology when you have these failures. Uh, and I was thinking back to... Um, uh, is it Goodnight and Farrell that wrote the piece on Three Mile Island? Mm -hmm. And when the individuals, uh, the, the engineers would speak to the public right. defending the technology, right. uh, you know, they had a great deal of problems. And, so, and that you know, has also uh, kind of affected how we see nuclear science mm. as, and not just nuclear power as, as right. a technology. Right. So I was curious if that was the maybe yeah. a potential distinction. Any other questions um, out there? Well, that's one thing to add. Uh, you're right about that. Probably basic research thing. Um, uh, there has been a lot of talk about basic research being, uh, uh, you know, devalued mm -hmm. in university prof among university professors. And you know, but the problem is funding. You know, and that's the same thing back in the United States as well as in Japan and in other countries in the world, probably. So uh, you know, putting more importance on basic research without or little tangible objects is worthwhile. And that's why they're trying to say probably. So he didn't really say that. <laughs> right. You know, even though even though you weren't listened to or consulted on this particular issue, I do like the fact that communication scholars actually have a seat at the table <laughs> right. with the uh, it, with the with the scientists, which uh, something I think we're somewhat jealous of as a rhetoric science scholar myself. Uh, any other questions um, out there? All right. Well, thank you very much. This has been a thank wonderful you. conclusion to I think a wonderful uh, conference, and I believe we head back to auditorium two. Uh, by eight or what's 18? No, I, I'm going to speak in uh, American it, at 5:15. We're supposed to be there. Is that correct? I think so. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. Let's give a round of applause to our two fine speakers <laughs> and to our fine translators. <laughs>